Hello. Uh, so let's start with the uh, introduction of cybersecurity. So this is like the first class uh, in the series of this uh, talk about security. Like we'll see like what the uh, term means, what are the general approaches, and so on. So let's uh, start. So the uh, the, the national uh, standards body NIST uh, identifies like uh, in in 1995 basically formalized the definition of uh, the term computer security uh, identified in its like computer security handbook uh, as like computer security defined as the protection that's afforded to an automated information system in order to attain the applicable objectives and the objectives are of preserving the integrity availability and confidentiality of information system resources now these resources can include anything like ha hardware uh, software firmware uh, data information uh, the communication networks telecommunication networks and so on so this definition like if we see this definition read this definition again like I've tried to underline these as well basically identifies three key objectives that are at the heart of computer security confidentiality okay uh, integrity and availability so the term of confidentiality basically uh, covers two related concepts which are data confidentiality and privacy so data confidentiality basically means that you're sure that the private or confidential information is not made available or disclosed to unauthorized individuals. Privacy on the other hand assures that individuals control or influence what information which is related to them may be collected and stored and by whom and to whom that information can be disclosed. Okay. There is a slight difference between the data confidentiality and the privacy of an individual. Okay. Then the term integrity basically also covers two related concepts of data and system integrity. So data integrity basically assures that information and programs are changed only in a specific uh, or like in, in a specified and authorized manner. Okay. So information and programs are changed only in a specified and authorized manner. System integrity uh, means that uh, like a system performs its intended function in an unimpaired manner, free from any deliberate or inadvertent unauthorized manipulation of the system. And finally, the third term availability basically assures that the system will work promptly and uh, the service is not denied to unauthorized or sorry to authorized users okay so these like confidentiality integrity availability basically define um, uh, the basic building blocks of any good security program uh, whether like when we define the goals for network asset information uh, information system security so these are collectively known as the cia triad like since there are three terms so triad uh, so although the abbreviation cia might not be intriguing like as the united states government spy organization right so it is still a concept that security professionals must know and understand Uh, so confidentiality, like I said, addresses the secrecy and privacy of information and it prevents unauthorized persons from viewing uh, sensitive information. Um, there are like different controls that can enhance the confidentiality. So those controls uh, include the use of uh, uh, information classification systems, such as like uh, requiring uh, sensitive data to be encrypted, for instance like news reports have uh, detailed several large-scale breaches uh, that we have seen in confidentiality 
as a result of corporations that are misplacing or losing laptops, uh, data or even backup media that contains uh, customer accounts, names, credit information and the like. So the simple act of encrypting this data could have pre uh, prevented for instance uh, uh, such losses or at least like minimizing or mitigating the damage, right? So, because sending information like an encrypted form basically denies attackers the opportunity to intercept and uh, uh, read or sniff that type of data and we'll talk about these things later today. Then integrity like I said provides the accuracy of information and offers users a higher degree of confidence that the information that they are actually viewing has not been tampered with. So integrity needs to be protected while it's in storage, it's at rest, or it's in transit. Right? Uh, so real life examples uh, of crypt, uh, like integrity, there are like different types of uh, hashing algorithms, cryptography as well used, and we'll talk like briefly about those as well. And then finally, the concept of availability, like I said, requires the information and systems be available whenever they are needed. Uh, so although many people may think of availability only in electronic terms, but availability also applies to physical access. Right? So if at 2 a.m., for instance, you need access to a backup media that is stored in a facility that allows access only from 8 to 5, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., that is, then you definitely have an availability problem, right? So the uh, availability in the world of electronics can manifest in uh, many ways. Uh, backups like, are the simplest way to ensure availability, especially in the cyber environment. Uh, backups pro can provide like a copy of critical information, critical systems, uh, should the data be destroyed or equipment can fail, right? So which of these like three uh, like CIA like confidentiality and integrity availability is considered the most important right so that is a basic question the answer is that depends so in different organizations with different priorities uh, one of these may take lead over the other uh, for instance like your local bank might consider integrity as the most important. However, an organization that is responsible for data processing might see availability as the primary concern, right? For instance, Google, for instance. So for them, google.com to be up all the time and servicing user requests is uh, more beneficial than, uh, or like more, uh, you can say, uh, of a requirement than saying uh, keeping all their system encrypted, right? So for them, availability is the paramount concern. Uh, then security management does not stop at these three. Uh, so these are but only three of the core techniques that apply to uh, security, system security, asset security, and so on. So true security in the general sense requires like a defense in depth kind of uh, approach. So in reality, like many techniques are required to protect the assets of an organization. And if you take like take a moment and look at this figure, right? So there are many terms that are defined here. So in the CIA triad, only the three terms were shown here. You can see like many of these uh, a response time, accountability, authentication, authorization, uh, prevention, physical access, uh, technical controls, administrative controls, and so on. Right. So it is actually quite complex, as this uh, pyramid can show you. Right. And obviously, like we'll talk about these things in detail during the course, uh, or like during the different lectures that we'll see.
like I just said, like controls are basically uh, put into place to reduce the risk that an organization can face. And they come in like uh, three main flavors, administrative, technical, and physical controls. Administrative controls are commonly referred to as soft controls because they are more of like management oriented. Examples of these controls are security documentation, risk management, personnel security, training, those kind of things. Technical controls are what we are concerned with mostly in this class. So these are software or hardware components as in firewalls, intrusion detection systems, encryption, identific uh, identification and authentication mechanisms and so on. And then finally physical controls are uh, like the name states for uh, protecting the facility as, as a general but for our class, like for a cyber uh, security class, uh, physical controls like guards, uh, locks, fencing, like those kind of things uh, we're not mainly concerned about, okay? Or we will not talk in detail about these types of controls. We are going to talk mostly about the technical controls. Then like there are, uh, uh, like I said, out of these uh, like a defense in depth kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, three other security concepts are like tightly related to the CIA triad. And these are like called the three A's or triple A's. Authentication, uh, like sorry, uh, authenticity, assurance, and anonymity. Let's start with assurance. So assurance is basically uh, um, like how trust is provided or managed in the computer systems. Like why do you, um, 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 how should I say, like a, a good example is that of Google, right? So we, when we say google.com and you search something, our expectation is that Google will deliver the results, right? So it is basically a behavioral expectation that people have of that system, right? So it's Google's policy to deliver results and so on. Similarly, like insurance so needs to be like people need to be assured or like users need to be assured like uh, how that system is to be trusted in a nutshell. Authenticity, like the property of being genuine and being able to be verified and trusted, okay? So confidence in the uh, validity of a transmission, a message, message originator, all these things, right? So this means like verifying that users are actually who they say they are and that each input that's arriving at the system came from a trusted source, okay? And then there are like different tools for these uh, we will talk about these as well, digital signatures, non-repudiation, and so on. Anonymity, again, the property uh, that certain records or transactions are not attributable to any individual. So this basically uh, has different techniques like aggregation, mixing, proxies, so what these techniques basically mean is that you have your data, let's say, available online somewhere in like different various uh, databases. So all of those different data sources should not be joined together to reveal your sensitive or private information. So if you want, if you are anonymous in one database, you should be um, remain anonymous or non-identifiable across all the databases. It should not be that you uh, um, can get data about an individual from one database, uh, aggregate that data, mix it with other sources, and uh, reveal the private information of that individual or person. Okay, So that's what anonymity basically refers to. Then there are like different types of threats and attacks that uh, a cyber system is uh, susceptible to. The first one, like the book states, is eavesdropping. And like the name 
uh, or sorry, the figure you can see like if Alice and Bob need to communicate with each other through a transmission or communication channel, which is represented through this pipe. So the threat is that an individual, let's say even this picture, can eavesdrop on that uh, communication channel, right? So this is like a network uh, connecting Alice and Bob and if Eve is sitting in the middle somewhere in the network, then Eve should not be able to eavesdrop on that conversation, right? Uh, and there are different types of uh, problems. Alteration is that if the message is being communicated through that communication channel, uh, the attacker should not be able to alter the mess uh, message. So that's one uh, of the biggest attacks uh, that the message is sent. The eavesdropper should not be able to uh, change that message. The figure suggests that a possible solution is send encrypted information. Right? And we will talk in detail about this. Then the, another attack, uh, basic um, attack is that of denial of service which is like the interruption or de degradation of data service or information access meaning that for what the figure is showing that you send so many messages or so many spam messages or so many um, uh, illicit requests or illegitimate requests to the person who is serving you for instance Alice that an actual message is lost in all of those Okay, so that's what this figure is basically showing. So send that to the degree that it basically fills up the queue or slows down the server or uh, the server becomes unresponsive. So that's the basic uh, denial of service. Then masquerading. So an unauthorized entity can gain access to a system or perform a malicious act by posing as an authorized entity right so what we are saying here like the figure shows is that um, it says that the message is from Alice when it's actually from someone else okay then in case of uh, uh, repudiation basically means that you deny um, that a user, for instance, can deny sending the data or receiving the data or even possessing the data, right? So that is called repudiation, that I repudiate this claim that um, I don't even have that data. So non-repudiation is basically a cornerstone of security systems in which uh, a person or a user cannot deny any of these sending, receiving, or possessing data, okay? And there are mechanisms in place um, to protect that. And this like finally like the uh, correlation traceback uh, attacks or threats just like I described in anonymity. It's the same thing that the integration of multiple data sources and information flows uh, should not be able to determine the source or like uh, protected piece of information. Okay, so that's what this is saying. Then like despite years of research and development, it has not been uh, possible to develop like a security design and implementation techniques that systematically exclude security flaws and prevent all unauthorized actions. So in the absence of such foolproof techniques, it becomes useful uh, or it is useful to have like a set of widely agreed upon design principles or standards that can actually guide us or guide the development of these protection systems or mechanisms. So the National uh, Centers of Academic uh, Excellence in Information Assurance uh, like which is jointly co-sponsored by uh, the National Security Agency of the US and the US Department of Homeland Security. They basically list these uh, 
design principle like security design principles okay starting from economy of mechanism fail safe defaults complete mediation open design and so on okay so let's briefly talk about these security principles so economy of mechanism uh, like a simple security framework uh, basically facilitates its understanding so that's the core of this principle economy of mechanism so simplicity in design right meaning uh, that if the design of of the security system is simple its implementation and verification is uh, and enforcement becomes easier so that's the gist of uh, this principle And then fail safe defaults the gist is that by default provide a safer environment meaning uh, that if you install something or let's say you uh, open a product in uh, uh, let's say a network router right so you open or install the router for the first time by default the environment or the controls that the router provide should have security embedded in them okay so that's what it says that by default uh, the control should be fail safe meaning that you don't have to go through elaborate schemes like if a person or if a layman does not understand the router protocols and so on once they plug it in they should be e easily um, uh, by like by default uh, security should be enabled it should not be that you have to go click through five six controls and then your security is enabled but it should be the other way around that if you need to turn that off then you can go through like a couple of hoops and then you can do that okay so that's the gist of this uh, fail safe default that by default system should be uh, safe or fail safe then complete mediation says like this if you read the first lines that every access to a resource must be checked for compliance with a protection scheme every access to a resource must be checked for uh, compliance meaning that if you change something in the system or like whenever a request comes to change the system or to retrieve any data from the system just check it whether that request complies with your security scheme or not the example states that sometimes uh, uh, like users are logged out like uh, what do you say uh, like those timeouts right so your request times out why is that because there's a system um, uh, in place that says that if like, after this much time has elapsed start a new session now when you start a new session now each request should be tested against your uh, security mechanism first so that's the first thing the second thing is if there's a change in the system right you change the system the code itself then you need to verify whether that still your system is still secure because whenever you change something in the code it may break some existing security mechanism okay so you should check for compliance with a security protection mechanism or scheme all the time for every request or every access or every change then open design so security architecture and the design of the system should be publicly available now this may seem counterintuitive just read it again security architecture and design of a system should be publicly available now you may think if our security design is available then uh, a person can hack into it a person can destroy the system right because they already know what the design of the system is not really why because there are like two parts to a, a security system one is the algorithm itself and one is the combination of keys okay what this principle says or open design principle says 
that your algorithm, like how things work, should be public. What those things are based on, which are the keys, those should stay private or those should be the hidden information. Why do we say that is that when your algorithms are public, then they are scrutinized better, right? Um, so people can check them whether that algorithm makes sense or not. If there are problems, researchers can go and fix them. And uh, if they are hidden, like if they are obscure, then a hacker or like a malicious person may find a loophole in the algorithm that nobody else knows. If the algorithms are public, they have been tested, they have been researched upon for like decades, eons, uh, not eons, like decades, uh, then it's ensured that those algorithms themselves are secure, right? Obviously, there's always a percentage chance that like still uh, you can find loopholes, which we see like um, all the time. But still, uh, the design, if, if those algorithms are public, it's easier or it's, it's easier to uh, scrutinize them and make them better. Okay. And we will, when we talk about like public, private keys, cryptography keys, then this will make more sense. Then separation of privilege, um, so it's a practice in which multiple privilege attributes are required to achieve access to a restricted resource. So a good example of this is like this multi-factor user authentication that we now see in phones, um, even in, in, in our university systems and so on. So what this requires is the use of multiple techniques such as passwords, smart cards, uh, uh, a code sent to your device and so on to authorize a user access to a given system, right? So multiple conditions need to be satisfied. Then least privilege means that every process and every user of the system should operate using the least set of privileges that are necessary to perform the task. Like if a person is authorized uh, access to multiple systems then least privilege means uh, that instead of like looking at all the hierarchy of, of that uh, uh, users access rights you only look at the access rights for that specific system. If the user has that, okay, grant him access. You don't even need to look and check for other system accesses, okay? Then least common mechanism basically means that the design should minimize the functions that are shared by different users, uh, providing mutual security. So this principle basically helps reduce the number of unintended communication paths and reduces the amount of hardware and software on which all users depend, thus making it easier to verify if there are any undesirable security implications. Okay. Then psychological acceptability implies uh, that the security mechanism should not interfere unduly with the work of users and at the same time uh, must meet the needs of those users who authorize uh, access. So if security mechanisms hinder the usability or accessibility of resources, users may opt to turn off those mechanisms. So where possible, security mechanisms should be transparent to the users of the system or at most introduce minimal obstruction. In addition to not being intrusive or burdensome, security procedures must reflect the user's mental mode of protection. So if the protection procedure do not make sense to the user or uh, if the user must translate his or her image of protection into a 
substantially different protocol, the user is likely to make errors, right? And then find uh, like uh, work factor. Uh, according to this principle, the cost of circumventing a security mechanism should be compared with resources of an attacker. Example given is that of uh, like your university database where the biggest con concern is of grades, like people changing others' grades or their own grades and so on. Uh, the cost of building that system versus a military installation Obviously, the military installation requires different types of security controls, more sensitive information. Um, hence, the cost of that system is higher in implementing the security protocols as compared to a university database, right? So that is uh, the cost of circumventing a security mechanism should be compared with the resources of an attacker. In our case, in the case of university, the attacker is what, let's say a student, the resources at the disposable of that student should, would be limited. Uh, in the case of a military installation, the resources are abundant because the uh, attackers are other rogue nations, which have thousands of dollars manpower at their disposal and they can hack into our military systems, Pentagon, and so on, right? Uh, so the work factor basically states that that first compare the uh, the resources available to the attacker, and then build your system according to that. Then compromise recording, the final uh, aspect, it basically says that sometimes uh, leaving your system susceptible to attack is better than uh, or cost feasible or uh, feasible. Um, and all you need to do is have some kind of recording mechanism that records like which user did which thing, right? So if the user came, he clicked this, this, that, you put everything in a log. So you let the users do that. Uh, but you can always come back to the log and see who did or who messed up what. So you can go and catch them, right? So in, in case of surveillance camera cameras, so that those are typical examples. So surveillance camera does not stop the attack, but it only records the attack, right? And then you can use that surveillance tapes and so on and then go catch the uh, culprits, okay? Then we are gonna uh, go over like some topics very briefly, like in an introductory manner and look at these uh, basic security terms. So the first one is access control. So in the broad sense, like all of computer security is concerned with access control. Right, so um, computer security in, in, in one instance has been defined as measures that implement and assure security services in a computer system, particularly those that assure access control service. Right, so access control implements a security policy that specifies who or what for example, in case of a process, may have access to each specific system resource. And the type of access that is actually permitted in each instance. So which users can read which files, are my files really safe, what does it mean to be like a root user, what do we really want to control and so on. So These types of questions are answered by access control. And the things that are used are these things users groups authentication mechanism password protection file protection access control list and so on so the figure this figure basically shows a broader a a context of access control okay so in addition to access control uh, the context basically involves uh, other entities like we said earlier authentication okay authorization 
and audits. So authentication is basically the verification that the credentials of a user or other system entity are valid. So the, so the user is validate, validated against a um, authorization database. Oh, sorry, authentication database. Once the user is authenticated, that the user is actually the actual user, then he needs to be authorized. So authorization is the granting of a right or a permission to a system entity to access a system resource. So this function determines who is trusted for a given purpose. So in when we log into eCollege, you are authenticated first against your username and password, right? So once you go in the system, so you log in, I log in at the same time. So we are both authenticated using our username and passwords. Once you're authenticated, then a student has different authorizations and a professor has a different authorization. So the professor is authorized to do X, Y, Z, while a student is authorized to do only A, B, and C, okay? So that's the difference between authentication and authorization. Uh, another example of authentication authorization is authentication is that you're actually holding the passport, that, you sh that passport shows that you are actually this individual. Then authorization is the visa on that passport that gives you entry to another country, okay? And then finally audit, so an independent review and examination of the system records and activities in order to test for adequate security controls to ensure that compliance with an established policy uh, uh, was done and to detect any breaches in security, right? So for instance, whenever we log in into eCollege and so on, so all um, like our click-throughs are logged as well. So they can see that this user was doing X, Y, Z and this user was doing this, this, this. Just to make sure that all the uh, security policies are in place. What they do at which level, I don't know and I'm, I'm not just saying that, but I'm telling you that there is some kind of audit in any kind of log log based system uh, it should be there okay so the access control uh, mechanism basically uh, mediates between a user user can be a process which is executing on behalf of a user and the system resources like which are like these uh, anything Operating system, firewalls, routers, files, databases, it can be any kind of resource. So like I said early, earlier, the system must first authenticate an entity that is seeking the access. So typically the authentication functions determines whether the user is permitted to access the system at all. Then the access control function determines if the specific uh, uh, Resource that is requested, whether the user is actually permitted to see or to read or to write to that resource. Then a security administrator maintains an authorization database that specifies what type of access to which resource is allowed for the user. And then the access control function consults this database to determine whether to grant access. And the auditing function monitors and keeps record of user accesses to these system resources. That's what this figure is basically showing. So the access control here in this figure is shown as a single logical module. In practice, a number of components may be cooperatively uh, sharing this access control function. All operating systems, whether it's Mac, Linux, Unix, whatever, have at least a rudimentary and in many cases a quite robust access control component. So add-on security packages can supplement the native access control capabilities of this operating system 
and then particular applications or utilities such as like database management systems can also incorporate access control functionalities. External devices as firewalls can also provide these access control services. Okay. So we have our databases uh, that have these access control list. We have our uh, uh, routers. They can have access control list and so on. So a general approach to access control, uh, which is usually exercised by operating systems or database management systems, is that of an uh, access control matrix or access matrix for short. So one dimension, so matrix is what, like a table, like a uh, 2D table, right? So one uh, dimension of the matrix, not, uh, yeah. So one dimension of the matrix consists of uh, identified subjects. Subjects are like that may attempt data access to the resources, um, which can be a user, a group, or a system. Right, to perform those functions and uh, typically this list will uh, 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 like consist of these uh, entities so the uh, other dimension basically lists the objects and these are the resources that may be accessed right so at the greatest level of detail Objects may be individual data fields, more aggregate groupings such as records, files, or even the entire database may also be objects in the matrix. So each entry in the matrix indicates the access rights of a particular subject for a particular object. Example is here. Uh, let's look at a simpler example. Okay, so in this figure, uh, we have users and we have files. Okay, so user A owns which files? User A owns file 1 and file 3. User A can also read these files and write to these files. User B, on the other hand, only owns file 2. But user B can read file 1 and 4 and 2 and can write to only 2 and 3 and so on, right, for C and every other user will be listed in this kind of matrix form in that uh, uh, access control mechanism, okay? So in practice, these access matrices are usually sparse, meaning that they can, uh, like, uh, uh, I'm sure you should know what a sparse matrix is, but if you don't, uh, uh, like there are very few entries in the matrix, okay? So that's why like access control matrices are not preferred, but they are like used in one of two ways. The first is in the form of an access control list. So when the matrix is decomposed by columns, so columns versus rows, okay, so when it's decomposed by columns, we get access control lists, okay. So columns are the resources. So for each object, an ACL or access control list basically defines or lists the users and their permitted access rights, okay, as you can see here. So for this resource, root has read-write access. Uh, for this resource, uh, this user, Roberto, has only read access. For this resource, Roberto has read and execute access and so on. Okay. So elements of the list may include individual users as well as groups of users. So we can say faculty can read and write. Students can only read this resource and so on. Um, so when it is desired to determine which subjects have which access rights to a particular resource, these ACLs are convenient 
because each ACL provides the information for a given resource. Instead of everything jumbled up together, this resource, you can only look at it individually, right? However, if I ask you or if I tell you, okay, change the access control lights for Roberto, then what do you have to do? Then you have to go into this resource, this resource access list, this access control list as well, right? So you have to go to multiple places. Then decomposition of rows, which yields in these capabilities or capability tickets makes more sense. So now you can just look at the users and go change their permissions, right? Um, so capability ticket, like it shows, specifies the authorized objects and the resources, oh sorry, and the operations uh, for a particular user. Each user has a number of tickets that he holds and may be authorized to loan or give some of them to others, right? Uh, so bigot, uh, like tickets can, well, the term ticket specifies this, this uh, capabilities that they can be dispersed or delegated. So because these tickets may be dispersed around the system, um, they present a greater security problem than the ACLs that we saw on the previous slide. Hence, uh, some people don't prefer these capability tickets, okay? Uh, because the biggest concern is that these tickets need to be unforgeable. Like if a user can forge a ticket, what's the use, right? So one way to accomplish this is to have the operating system hold all the tickets on behalf of the users. Then these tickets would have to be held in a region of memory, which is inaccessible to users. Another alternative is to include an unforgeable unfor token in the capability itself. Um, this could be large random password or a cryptographic message uh, with authentication codes and so on. And we will see like these. Uh, so the convenient and inconvenient aspects of these capability tickets are the opposites of those ACLs. So it is easy to determine the access rights of a given user has, but more difficult to determine the list of users with specific access rights for a specific resource. So which one to choose, again, depends on your uh, type of system that you're designing um, or the type of uh, user requests you service, essentially. So traditional access control systems define the access rights of individual users and groups of users that we just saw. So in contrast, role-based access control is based on the roles that users assume in a system rather than the user's identity. So typically these RBAC systems or role-back access control models define a role as a job function within an organization. So RBAC system assigns access rights to the roles instead of individual users. Like I said earlier, student versus faculty. So in turn, users are assigned to different roles, either statically or dynamically, according to their responsibilities. So this relationship of users to role in is many to many. As is, as is the uh, relationship of roles to the resources or these system objects as shown in this figure. So the set of users uh, changes in some environments very frequently and the assignment of a user to one or more roles may also be dynamic. So the set of roles in the system in most environments is relatively static with only occasional additions or deletions, right? So for instance, in a university system, you can think of all these as users as students. Students come and go, but their roles as, uh, let's say, GAs, TAs, RAs, or uh, faculty and other types of like administrative roles, roles are consistent, 
usually resources are pretty much consistent so roles mapping to resources is pretty much consistent but any number of users can come and go right so in that case role based access control makes more sense and how to represent it again using roles r1 to n and different types of uh, resources and so on so similar type of representation in uh, r back okay the next topic of cryptography so cryptography is the science of hiding information in plain sight in order to conceal it from unauthorized parties so it is essentially the process of transforming data so that it appears to be gibberish except to those who know something known as a key right so today cryptographic systems are mandatory to protect email corporate data personal information electronic transactions and so on but it dates back through the ages so the truth is that as long as there have been people there have been secrets right so one early system that was used by the ancient greeks and the spartans is called the cytale so this system basically functioned by wrapping strips of uh, papyrus around a rod of fixed diameter on which a message was written the recipient used a rod of the same diameter on which he wrapped the paper to read the message so if anyone intercepted the paper itself it appeared as a meaningless uh, gibberish or meaningless letters so unless they knew that key that what is the size of that rod they wouldn't be able to put these uh, characters together right so another famous uh, uh, encryption scheme is that of Julius Caesar, right? So even Julius Caesar encrypted messages sent between himself and his trusted advisors. Many might not consider it a robust method of encryption, but Caesar's cipher basically worked by means of a simple substitution that instead of one letter, use another letter. I think he, it was done by a uh, offset by three that if you were talking about a that meant move three spaces so write a d instead of that if you want to write a b write another letter for instance d like this graphic basically shows you this substitution cipher uh, but caesar may have used an offset by three but this one is an offset by what 26 right so when Caesar was ready to send a message, it was encrypted by moving the text forward according to that key. Whatever the key was. If the key was three characters, then the word cat would be FDW. Right? C, A, and T becomes W. Okay? So you can try this yourself by referring to this figure. Um, so Caesar cipher is also known as rotation cipher and a key of three is called rot three. If the rotation is done by five, it's called an ROT five or rot five. So ancient Hebrews also use similar cryptographic systems. Uh, the mo famous one was Atbash that worked by replacing, replacing each letter that's used with an, uh, another letter the same distance away from the end of the alphabet. So A was a Z, B was a Y, and so on. Okay, so same distance from the end of the alphabet. So alphabet is growing this way, and the end of the alphabet is going this way. So encryption. I hope you all know what it means. Uh, to establish that confidential communication so that nobody can eavesdrop on that so if the information is encrypted then only Alice and Bob should be able to uh, decipher the message non nobody else the message itself is called plain text 
when it's converted uh, or encrypted using something called a key then it's called a uh, ciphertext and then when ciphertext gets decrypted then you get the original plain text okay and again to use encryption or to decrypt something you need keys okay some kind of key here the figure shows shared secret key there can be public keys private keys and we'll talk about these also so this is just what it's saying that you have uh, uh, your cipher becomes when you have your original message you in apply an encryption protocol on an algorithm you get a cipher text when that cipher text goes through a decryption algorithm you get the original message back okay and then on this slide there are some uh, things that the whole crypto system needs uh, it needs keys decryption keys cipher text the algorithms to encrypt decrypt and so on So then I said there are two types of systems, symmetric and asymmetric, depending on the keys. So in a symmetric cryptography, the sender and the receiver use two instances of the same key. Okay, so the key is shared, hence the name shared secret key. And symmetric means it's the same key. Okay. So it's symmetric across both sender and recipient. So key has dual functionality that it can carry out both encryption and decryption processes. So symmetric keys are also known as secret keys because this type of encryption relies on each user to keep the key a secret and properly protect it. So if an intruder were to get this key, then the whole scheme falls apart. Okay, and again, the algorithms for encrypting and decrypting, those everybody know. Okay, whether it's SHA, if it's Rivest, it's Edelman, whatever the algorithm is used, uh, people know that. Uh, malicious users, attackers, hackers, everybody know that. They don't know these keys. Okay. But the problem in this uh, is how do you distribute the keys, right? So if there is Alice and Bob, they need to share that key. If that she, uh, key is sent over the internet or the same communication channel, the eavesdropper can get the key and there's no use then, right? So there has to be some out of band communication, meaning that out of network or somehow they should be have or they should have that key okay so then the problem is this distributing of keys and keys are so many that each user uh, uh, group needs their own secret keys Alice and Bob need their key Alice and uh, Sam may need their own key uh, Bob and Sam need their own key for their communication and so on so for n users there are n times n minus 1 over 2 keys that need to be uh, shared among those users and again this sharing is out of band out of network how it's done again is problematic right it's very fast but it is a problematic uh, system because the issuance or the sending of the keys is not an easy task without getting uh, diverged so then comes in public key cryptography so in these public key systems each entity has different keys or they're called asymmetric keys or private public keys okay the basic uh, fun is or the uh, interesting part is that these keys are mathematically related to each other so if a message is encrypted, encrypted by one key, the other key is required to decrypt it. And only the other key can decrypt it because that key is mathematically related to 
this key okay so in this kind of system we have private public keys how they work is that a user let's say a recipient has a key that is only private to him and he has a key which is publicly known to everybody else okay so for this user the recipient using that public key that the sender already knows he can use that key encrypt the message send the message and then the recipient on his own holding a key that is only known to this recipient can decrypt that message okay again the algorithms that are used are known everybody knows that how that drivest algorithm works so drivest algorithm works on a public key private key that everybody knows since we do not know the keys themselves we cannot uh, know bob's information or what the message was for bob okay so the scheme looks something like this everybody has their own private keys and they have their public keys public keys are broadcasted to everybody else so sharing of the keys is not a problem because everybody can know the public key using that public key they can encrypt information send to the user user using their own private key that only they know can decrypt the message okay so that's the beauty of this system that it's widely applicable it's a little slower than symmetric key cryptography but it's very easy to maintain okay so well, this slide basically gives you the uh, pros and cons uh, of symmetric and asymmetric systems you can go read through this slide um, like what attributes are discussed of the keys the exchange speed use and so on okay the next topic is that of digital signatures so digital signatures are based on uh, public key cryptography and are used to verify the authentic authenticity and integrity of a message so digital signatures are uh, created by passing uh, a message content through a algorithm known as a hashing algorithm and then encrypting it with a sender's private key once the message is received okay so once the message is received it's encrypted using the uh, uh, sender's private key so the recipient decrypts the encrypted hash and then recalculates the received message's hash now these values should match to ensure the validity of the message and to prove that the message was sent by the party that's believed to have sent it so because only the party that has access to the private key right so we can break this in a series of steps so bob produces a message okay a uh, message digest that is by passing the message through a hashing algorithm so the message is passed through this hashing algorithm it and you get a digest of that message like instead of a four page document you get um that's a 128 characters that message digest is then encrypted using bill's private key okay so bill passes his document uh, through the hashing algorithm and encrypts it using his private key then the original message uh, is encrypted using the public key of the recipient and sent to the recipient alice then alice creates a message digest from the message with the same hashing algorithm that bill used alice then decrypts bill's signature digest by using the public key like that's bill's public key and finally alice compares the two message digests the one originally created by bill and the other that she created if the two values match then alice can rest assured that the message is unaltered if the message is altered a little bit then the signatures don't match okay again using public key cryptography very strong mechanism digital certificates 
are used to prove uh, your identity when you're performing electronic transactions. These are also at the heart of the PKI system, public key infrastructure system. And the digital certificate serves two roles. One, it ensures the integrity of the public key and makes sure that the key remains unchanged and in a valid state. Two, it validates that the public key is tied to a stated owner and that all associated information is true and correct. So the information that's needed to accomplish these goals is added into the digital certificate. So certificates are formed, uh, formatted to different types of standards. X509 is one of the most common standards. Uh, and what this has is like the version number, the serial number, the algorithm that's used the validity of the certificate, the subject, the public key algorithm used and so on. Okay, so many details are in the certificate. Now, as mentioned previously, one of the things that cryptography offers to its users is the capability to verify this integrity and authentication. So integrity assures a recipient that the information remains unchanged and is in its true original form. Authentication, on the other hand, provides the capability to ensure that messages are sent from who you believe sent them and that messages are received by the intended recipient. So hashing algorithms uh, function by taking a variable amount of data and compressing it into a fixed length of value which is referred to as a hash value or the message digest as we said earlier. So hashing essentially provides a fingerprint or a message digest of the data, which can be like pages and pages of records, documents, messages, whatever. So strong hashing algorithms are hard to break and will not produce the same hash value for two or more messages. So hashing can be used to meet the goals of integrity and or non-repudiation, depending on how the algorithms are used. So hashes can help verify the information has remained unchanged. And uh, they are not intended to be reversed to reproduce the data. So the purpose of the message digest is to verify the integrity of the data and the message. Right. So in a well-designed uh, message digest, if there are even a slightest change in the output or input string, sorry, the input string, the output hash value will change dr drastically. Okay. And this is known as the avalanche effect. That a small change makes the whole digest appear totally different. Right. And these are like we have the algorithm examples are these SHA1, uh, 2, 3, MD5, Although it's no longer recommended, this is like one of the older ones and so on. Finally, passwords. Everybody knows what they are, short sequence of characters, what they mean, uh, how they are used to authenticate users. You are a user. Uh, you have to provide a password. Sometimes you might run a hash function to get a password. Passwords. Uh, need to be strong, uppercase, lowercase, different characters, special characters, numbers, so on, right? Um, they need to be complex, what's the length, and so on. Uh, odd number of characters usually makes passwords safer because it's harder to crack odd character passwords, and so on. Longer passwords are better because it's harder to break them. So, I mean, these are basic things that you know them. Um, so you can read. Finally, social engineering is a concept in which uh, how do you get information out of people? Usually it's through social engineering. Uh, Pretexting is a technique in which the person calls and says, hey, I, I am in the uh, big problem. I am friend of your friend, blah, blah, blah. He's in jail. 
he needs this information can you tell me his birthday and this and that if you divulge that information that birthday can then be used to get social security numbers and this and that so that's what social engineering pretexting does that you create a story that convinces an administrator or an operator to reveal a secret information or piece of information then you take that information uh, and then you can use whatever techniques to get more information from that piece of information or that may be the only information that you needed for instance baits that you offer kind of gift to a user that I will give you fifteen dollars if you tell me something else or if you click through this message you will receive fifteen dollars and so on right uh, quid pro quo uh, you offer an action or service and then expect nothing in return right uh, thinking that oh this was done for free but actually something malicious is happening on the back end okay uh, so this is basically uh, like the end of the lecture the brief high level introduction of uh, cyber security and in the other classes we will go deeper into the concepts and learn more about these uh, topics okay and that is all for this class.